position. Douglas said, yeah, that's, that's the case now, but the slaves don't think it's the case. For enslaved people, they believe and are acting on the belief that the war is about emancipation. And so he has this wonderful line, which kind of very like James uh, in later writings, we are not to be saved by the captain, but by the crew. So this kind of scandalous dismissal from the, of the history profession of Lerone Bennett's Forced Into Glory, great book, uh, Forced into, into Glory. This is what Douglas was laying out a challenge for, and this is what Du Bois, in uh, talking about the general strike of the slaves, uh, was wanting to, to emphasize. So I'll, I'll, uh, just to... to in the interest of time. Uh, let's take a look at, a, at a, a great painting of the general strike of the slaves. This is Winslow Homer, who had earlier in the war drawn racist caricatures, very early in the war, he was a war correspondent, and he drew racist caricatures for magazines, one called Our Jolly Cook that gets reprinted a lot. But the very fact of emancipation, what in that skip slide uh, uh, Du Bois calls the great intellectual rebound of the nation, uh, the, the, the fact of slaves emancipating themselves by walking to the Union Army and fighting on the Union side, or if they don't go to the Union Army, refusing to be disciplined on the plantation in the way that they had been uh, disciplined on the, on the plantation, uh, that inspiration changed Winslow Homer's mind and made this same person who had done these minstrel caricatures of African Americans able to produce this as his summative work about the meaning of the Civil War. He does it right after the, the Civil War. Uh, while he's doing commercial work, he, he does this, uh, this painting. And uh, the painting is, is uh, I think, Homer meant to have it called Near Andersonville. Uh, whoever owns a painting gets to title it. So it's been called At the Cabin Door at various times. It's been called Captured Liberators uh, at, at various uh, times. But what um, Homer gives us access to here is what Du Bois meant by the general strike of the slaves and how it changes the whole drama and how it really gives us a magnificent drama. So the um, upper left uh, corner are the captured liberators. They're uh, Union troops who are being marched off by Confederate troops to Andersonville Prison, which was kind of a death sentence in these latter stages of the, of the Civil War. I think a, a, a Union soldier in nine who died in the last months of the war died in Andersonville uh, Prison. So that's the story that's our drama of the Civil War. It's the story that, that made-for-TV Civil War is about. It's about the relations between those Union troops and Confederate troops, and maybe they went to West Point together, or their sisters married into the other family, and they have these complicated ties, and now this is the tragedy and the drama of the Civil War and the made-for-TV Civil War. Not just Douglas, not just Du Bois, but Homer here says no. The center of this magnificent drama is the brain of the black woman who's at the center of this, of this picture. And I used to think, until a school teacher from New York corrected me on this, and the Newark Museum owns this painting. And I went there to give a talk about it without ever having seen it except in reproductions and in my own reproductions of it. And I thought it was huge. And I got there, it's about this big. So the, the actual captured liberators looks like kind of a thumbprint. It's so small and, and uh, indistinct. But we were having a discussion of it after with some mostly school teachers uh, from New York. And I said, and so the drama is her brain, she's trying to decide, wrapped under this African headdress, she's de trying to decide what she's going to do about this moment in history. And this school teacher said, no, she's already taking part in the general strike of the slaves. She's immaculately clean and it's daytime. <laughs> she's one of, already one of the enslaved people who's not obeying the orders on the plantation that's helping. And Du Bois talked about two kinds of participation in the general strike of the slaves. Douglas himself writes during the war 
about um, the use of the Underground Railroad by enslaved people to free white soldiers and put them on the Underground Railroad to evade recapture so that they could get back to their own troops. One way to kind of overread this painting would be to say she's thinking about her responsibility to those captured liberators and whether she has a role in uh, getting them back to, to safety. Um, let me go back and maybe I'll even skip the slave trade. Um, so this is a, a place where this magnificent drama is a place where I really want us to think about whether we've taken on Du Bois or not. And the way that we think we have taken on Du Bois on the general strike of the slaves is that Eric Foner's monumental book on Reconstruction begins with a tribute to Du Bois and sort of says, I grew up in a communist family. I knew about Du Bois. Here I am, better archives, better graduate students. Now I can do the book that he might have done. But that book, that Foner book, begins in 1863. Boyce began these discussions in 1850 and talked about the role of fugitive slaves in setting the Civil War into, into motion. Foner begins after the Emancipation Proclamation. So that all that magnificent drama of the general strike of the slaves is not a part of the drama of Foner's book on Reconstruction at all. And I will do the, the final one just because uh, it makes the same point from a different angle. Du Bois's uh, 1896 dissertation is the suppression of the African slave trade to the United States, Harvard dissertation, published by Harvard, but not really published as a book until 1954, when Eugene Genovese, the great historian, of, was a graduate student then, and, and uh, convinces Du Bois to let him have it and, and publishes it. It's a bitter indictment of the, controvers of, of the compromises that the founding fathers made in continuing the slave trade and of the lost moment of revolution that they um, uh, decided to ignore. Um, Sean Wilentz's new book, No Property in Man, which is a, a study, a very, very, very hyped study about the supposed achievement of the Founding Fathers of not mentioning slavery in the Constitution. He says this was actually part of a grand strategy that enabled them not to have the Constitution go on record in favor of slavery. And it was actually a victory for human freedom to extend the slave trade and to uh, develop a political system which, because of the Three-Fifths Compromise, let slaveholders rule almost the whole time until the Civil War. There's one mention of Du Bois's uh, suppression of the African slave trade in No Property in Man, and that's Willens finds a little corner where Du Bois agrees with him and says, supporting me on this point is W.E.B. Du Bois. So I think sometimes we declare victory a little bit too early or on too narrow a grounds when we think that this revolutionary thinker can in some kind of easy way be assimilated into the kind of knowledge that um, undergirds patriotic textbooks and uh, uh, progressive narratives, to go back to the morning, progressive narratives about the unfolding of freedom in the United States. And I'll stop there, thanks. Yeah. 
and then he talked about the Carolinas and the fact that he connected the Anglo slave system with the French slave system. Right, right. And can you, uh, what's the roots of that? Yeah, I, I reread Suppression, the only book of Du Bois that I reread for this lecture. And the most outstanding thing to me was this chapter on Haiti, which is kind of at the midpoint of the dissertation. And in general, the suppression has the same structure as Black Reconstruction. It's about the national story and then a whole lot of states and regional uh, stories. But he sees, the, he sees Haiti as this kind of uh, test case uh, about how committed to freedom the founding fathers were that that Haiti could and in, in, in terms of rhetoric should have been the revolutionary ally of the United States and Haiti writes to try to be uh, in revolutionary alliance with the United States uh, during the war of 18, 1812. Uh, so Du Bois is the same idea of tragedy that beggared the Greek. It's 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 his uh, looking Haiti looking at Haiti and uh, refusing its revolutionary solidarity, its help in policing the, 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 uh, the slave trade, uh, but also in going through with the abolition of the slave trade legally in 1808, because Haiti is a, is a warning uh, to the, the revolution itself, as Gerald Horn has shown, has really, uh, had really uh, alerted the founding fathers to the dangers of having even more importation of slaves. But then there was still sentiment in the uh, 18 aughts, uh, run up to 1808, that you could still have the slave trade. It, you didn't have to abolish it in 1808. And Haiti is, is a powerful example to say, no, that's, that's uh, that revolutionary road. And Du Bois also is one of the, the first people to, uh, say in print that uh, Haiti, uh, that the victories of the Haitian Revolution conditioned the purchase of Louisiana uh, for the, the United States. So that's also a point he makes in that chapter on, on Haiti. Others? Yes. Well, I, I think this is going to come up this afternoon. Du, du Bois uh, mostly uh, didn't write for academic audiences. He episodically had university uh, positions. He was, as Alden Morris has shown, the founder of American sociology. So without uh, trying to pursue a dogged careerist path, he did a lot of fantastic academic uh, work. But his emphasis was on popular audiences, movement activity, uh, connecting with, with, with struggle, uh, more, I think, uh, than, than it was uh, on uh, fitting into an academic establishment. One of the things that gets said about the ignoring and marginalization of Du Bois is that uh, Black Reconstruction was very little reviewed in historical journals. And that's true, uh, people just didn't get it, but, um, or wanted not to get it, uh, but I don't think he expected that it would have been reviewed in mainstream historical journals or understood in mainstream historical journals. And it was, as Aptecker's reprint of it, uh, of Black Reconstruction in a scholarly edition shows, very re reviewed in public. It had newspaper reviews, it had lots of journal reviews, not only in the black press. It was a book that was noticed. And I think that that's the decision that, uh, that Du Bois made, or maybe the society made it for him, that he wasn't going to orient himself toward professional academics, he was gonna orient himself toward a popular audience. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do we do with this notion of a working class? Uh, do we make a quarrel? Do we 
Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah, my main goal, and so the question was, uh, what do we do with the, uh, the term white working class when manifestly a lot of people think of themselves, maybe even more people than ever, think of themselves as being white working class people. I, my goal here and lately is to interrupt the kind of automatic roll off your tongue white working class uh, way that this is being invoked. And the best example of this is... Uh, the uh, legal scholar Joan Williams' book, which I think is probably called White Working Class, it came out uh, last year, and, and it's kind of the best uh, blaming of white workers for the election of, of, uh, of Trump, a very instant history uh, kind of thing. But once we let white working class roll off our tongues, my worry is that we then say this is a coherent group that's defined equally by race and class and we can appeal to them based on where they are in that self definition and that's been tried that's been tried kind of going back to George Wallace and to and to to Bill Clinton and in different ways and what happens when people say we're here I am I'm going to pay attention to the white working class they pay attention to all of the worst things about white workers and miss the possibility that the working class could be what the kind of identity that we're trying to build. And in order to do that, you have to challenge the white, the, the white part of it. So when Clinton was elected, uh, he made uh, Macomb County, Michigan, the centerpiece of his campaign, and Stanley Greenberg, the great pollster, former academic, uh, went with UAW money to Macomb, Michigan, to try to figure out who were these white workers. They called them the white middle class in that incarnation of things. But who were these white it was auto workers uh, who had gone over to vote for Reagan? And what were their issues? The polling, really expensive polling, all took place in white workers' houses. Not at work, not at a union hall. The connection with the UAW was never mentioned by the Clinton campaign. So to access the grievance of the white worker, we go exactly to the place where white workers uh, are most at home in rehearsing white lore in unchallenged sorts, sorts of ways. So what do you get? You get that what the white workers want, what the white middle class auto worker uh, wants in the way that green is no school busing, is crack down on, 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 uh, on crime, is the kind of things that gave us the effective death penalty, the kind of things that gave us the end of welfare as we know it. That would, all those things were meant to be um, a set of appeals to an imagined white working class. And I would want to interrupt that and say, no, the interview should actually happen at work. And you should think about what the, if the union's going to fund them, what should, they, what should be the, the class content of this, instead of starting from where white workers get to be their most unchallenged and, and most. Because I think in a lot of cases, white working people have very, very mixed consciousness. And they are class conscious. And sometimes they realize that in moments they realize that they'd be better off in alliance with popular social movements. But if we say we're going to, and this will happen, guarantee you, you can write me in 2020, this will happen, we're going to pay attention to the white working class. And what that means is pay attention to the white working class at its very worst. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, is there anybody else who hasn't asked a question yet before I go back to you? Yep.
Yeah, the two places where I really wrestle with it the most, and uh, because I've made commitments to not say slave, but to say enslaved persons, and you just heard me say slave a couple of times in this, I, I say it, and then I say, oh my God, I said slave again. I, what I mean to say is enslaved persons. And I actually, this is not just political correctness for me. I, I think that the whole idea of the general strike of the slaves really works better if we think of uh, slaves as enslaved persons and the term enslaved persons forces us to think about masters and to think about a class uh, relationship. So I'm all for it and I don't always do it. And the other one is United Statesian instead of American. Uh, and you all being down nearer the border than we are in Kansas, we, you know, we should try to do that. When we, when we want to talk about the United States, we should try to stay United Statesians instead of American. But Three years ago, I was president of the American Studies Association. You know, we got the letterhead printed up and we're not changing. And so, uh, but, I, but that's not to say that I don't think your, your point is, isn't well taken about striving to do these things and kind of, and there are a lot of them, so. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've written about kind of empire and language, the word gook. I wrote an essay on the word gook as a kind of military, imperial, racist uh, uh, formation that didn't apply to Asian people, it applied to Haitians uh, during the occupation of, of, of Haiti. But it, uh, all getting beyond the United States pays off enormously. And thinking about the role of the United States in the world, uh, US, South Africa, uh, comparisons, not just comparisons, but transnational uh, connections. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in Australia. What could be a greater challenge to the critical study of whiteness for us than Australia? You know, we say it's the African-American other that gives us whiteness. That's the crucible. No African-American other in Australia, and if there's a country that has racism most like the United States, it's Australia. Uh, so, you know, what, what is the role of settler colonialism then? Uh, what is the role of export of U.S. ideas? Uh, Chinese exclusion in Australia and New Zealand is very much done in concert with U.S. imperialism and British and U.S. imperialism are, are learning from each other. But uh, I just want to notice the connection between your comment and the Haiti comment because it happens again and again in Du Bois that you think he's writing about the United States. Here he is, he's rooted here, he knows about here, and then all of a sudden it's about the caste system in India or all of a sudden in suppression uh, it's about Haiti. And that magnificent drama uh, uh, tragedy uh, section at the end of Black Reconstruction, it then lapses into, segues into a paragraph on China and on the whole bloody world that's created uh, by white supremacy. So I, I think that I'm almost certain that will come up this afternoon again and I'm glad to be kind of the most United Statesian person on a panel. Uh, so it's definitely coming up in the other talks. So 
Maybe stop. Oh, okay. There's one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. The social status, uh, economic opportunity, or have you done any research? I haven't really. I have a feeling you know more about that than, than, uh, than I do. I, I do wish sometimes that we thought about Du Bois as a mixed race person a little bit more. I think that some of what he wrote about the Talented Tenth and, and other things, would we could profit by having that conversation, although, you know, Du Bois says, that, I think in uh, The Souls of White Folk, he says, uh, the person who's, who's a Negro is the person who has to ride in that coach in the state of Georgia. <laughs> so, you know, he, he was very aware that to be mixed race wasn't to have any mystery about what race in the United States that you, that you fell into. But I still think that to think about his, uh, his position as a mixed race leader of African American people is probably a profitable thing. Yeah. Right. Great. Thank you.